in the event, but continue to ask for your safety and wisdom as COVID numbers are continuing to rise in our country. We thank you for the many Christian contacts we've made through this term, through our evangelism at church. For those at Cafe, Baby Grows, Jam Club, C3 Youth and contacts through the assemblies at Bolton Le Sands. We pray that the invites to church and the barbecue will be received well and that those we've invited along would come. We pray that we would each be inviting personal contacts and following up those we've had at quiz events and Easter nights and we pray that they would come. We pray that they would receive a great welcome and have a taste of the gospel through meeting our church family. We pray for the preparations being made, that all things would come together well and through it bring you glory. Amen. Father, we thank you that you are the giver of all good things, including rest. We thank you that over the next few weeks there will be opportunity for our church family to slow down and have rest. We pray that you would bless us with good rest and refreshment. Please would we spend the time wisely and may we have more opportunities to sit in under your word and rest in it. Father, we pray that this summer would renew our energy and vigour ready for September. Amen. Father, we've read a few weeks ago in Luke that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. We are so aware that you love to save your people and that we need to be proclaiming your life-saving truths to those around us. We pray that you would be helping each of us to be prayerful about this work and equipping us to have bold conversations day to day. Father, we pray you would be using us as workers to harvest and through our weak and feeble attempts, people would turn to you in repentance and faith to the praise of your glory. We thank you, Father, that this work is all yours. Your word is powerful and will change hearts. Your will be done. Amen. And finally, Father, we pray for Moreland's Church in Lancaster. We thank you so much for their love for you and desire to teach and share the gospel faithfully. We pray for their summer series in Philippians and pray for the preaching group who are doing this teaching. We pray this would be a real encouragement to the church and a good opportunity for training for the preaching group as they grapple to understand and faithfully teach the truths of your word. We also pray for their summer getaway, for the 45 young people coming from different churches. We pray that this would be a great opportunity for the young people to grow their relationships with each other, but most of all that they would be challenged by and changed by what they hear in Haggai. May your spirit be at work in their hearts to grow their confidence and dependence on Jesus as they do this. And finally, Father, we thank you for the money they've already raised to complete the renovation work on their church building. We thank you that they've already raised three quarters of their target in your great provision and pray that you would provide the last quarter so that they may be able to make the church a usable and multifunctional building to use for your glory as they speak Christ in the town of Lancaster. Again, Lord, we pray you would use Borland's church greatly in Lancaster for the growth of your kingdom. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. Our reading uh, this week is from Luke chapter 11, which is on page 1042 in our Blue Bibles. So Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation.
Good morning, everybody. Let me have my welcome. Good to see you. We are going to be in Luke, so please keep that passage open. That'd be really helpful. Page 1042. Kids, you should have some sheets to follow. Let me just um, add to what John said or reiterate what John said earlier. We'd so love to see you for lunch this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be out um, outside and it'll be secure and so on. I really hope we can be together. That'd be fantastic. I'm going to pray as we begin. Father, please help us to listen to your word to us this morning. Amen. So listen to these commands in scripture. Pray without ceasing. Be constant in prayer and continue steadfastly in prayer. Well, I don't know about you, but I imagine some of you will have a sort of sinking feeling on hearing those commands. We know, don't we, that all too often we fail. So I want to ask you a question as we begin. This is a question particularly aimed at Christians. Christians, why don't you pray? Why don't you pray? Maybe we're too busy. Uh, C.S. Lewis had a phrase in his book, The Screwtape Letters, the kingdom of noise. And that is where many of us live, isn't it? The kingdom of noise. Life is a non-stop whirlwind. There's noise coming in everywhere. We're rushing from one thing to the next. We're overloaded. No time for prayer. And yet we do have time, don't we? Time to watch that film on DVD. Maybe don't bother with that one. Mary Poppins Returns, not one of my favourites. We do have time to play a board game, perhaps. Or perhaps we have time on social media, on our phone. So I think life can be frenetic for some of us, but are we really too busy to pray? Truth be told, we don't pray, not because we're too busy, but because we don't think it's important enough. Because we've forgotten what prayer is. Why don't you pray? Maybe you're too busy. Maybe it's because you feel too guilty. Perhaps there's some sin you've committed recently. It could be a big sin and you, you hate that sin and you just can't bring yourself to pray. I mean, how could you? Because you've gone away from God big time. Or it could be because you feel guilty about the direction of your life. Your life is going down the road of rebellion and you find you can't pray anymore. You're facing away from God uh, and... Uh, your guilt means uh, you're living as if he's not in charge and you feel guilty and it feels you can't turn and pray. Too guilty to pray. I don't want to say you've forgotten what prayer is, if that's the case. Too proud. Now, I doubt very much anybody would say, I am too proud to pray. I doubt you would say that. But you maybe got to, uh, uh, you do anything but pray sometimes. You know, I can deal with this on my own, a bit like uh, John trying to build his crane without the instructions. And maybe we worry, maybe we moan, maybe we take advice, maybe we sort it out ourselves. We don't like asking for help. Many of us hate being needy. We want to sort things out on our own, thanks very much. It could be that we're too proud to pray. And I think, again, we've forgotten what prayer is. Here's another reason why we don't pray. Maybe we're too fatalistic. That's an unusual word, perhaps. But fatalism is the idea of, you know, well, we are where we are. It is what it is. It's one of them, which is a kind of COVID catchphrase, isn't it? This kind of thinking can even be dressed up as Christian, a Christian attitude. God's in charge of this universe. We believe that. So don't need to pray. God rules everything. So why pray? Maybe we're too fatalistic. Or maybe uh, we've forgotten uh, uh, we're too faithless. We don't like to say it out loud, but we could be wondering if there's any point to prayer. Maybe we find ourselves with sympathy with the, in sympathy with the atheist who says, prayer, how to do nothing and still think you're helping. Maybe we think, oh, actually, maybe it does feel like I'm doing nothing. Um, as one writer put it, we prize accomplishments and production, but prayer is nothing but talking to God. It feels useless, as if we are wasting time. Every bone in our body screams, get to work! Just get on, do stuff! I know that feeling myself. So maybe we're valuing work over prayer. Or maybe you've experienced just praying so hard for something, being desperate for something, and you think, it makes sense the Lord to give it to you, and he hasn't, and, and you've kind of given up hope. Perhaps we don't believe prayer works, so we don't do it. Too busy, too guilty, too proud, too fatalistic, too faithless. All of those reasons can be summed up in one big reason, and this is, I think, we don't pray 
because we don't know what prayer is. Is there a slide for that, Matt? Thank you. We don't pray because we don't know what prayer is. We don't know all we've forgotten, what prayer is and what prayer is for. Last week, as John reminds us, we heard about one thing needed, sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to Jesus, his message about himself, the king who serves, the one thing needed. And today we're going to hear about the second thing needed. The Lord speaks to us and then we speak to our Father. So let's get stuck in and see prayer, the second thing needed, what it is and what it's for. Pray. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. This is verse 1 of chapter 11. Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So prayer is so important. And the disciples have seen Jesus pray uh, before his baptism, before his transfiguration, before he called the 12 disciples. And Luke has told us that Jesus was a man of prayer. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So they've seen Jesus pray. They've heard Jesus pray. He's known for his time uh, with the Lord, speaking to him. They've seen how important it is to Jesus and they want to help to do it themselves. Like Mary, they want to listen to Jesus. They want to sit at Jesus' feet and learn from him. Now, I think this is the only time in the Gospels that anybody asks Jesus to teach them. Isn't that extraordinary? So this is, on your sheets, kids, a good request. John's taught his disciples to pray. They've seen their master praying. Lord, how can we pray? They ask the expert. And what do they want to find out? Do they want to find out whether they should stand up to pray, sit down to pray, kneel to pray? What the atmosphere should be like, you know, you've got to create the vibe, haven't you? You've got to uh, sort, of out, sort out the lighting. Maybe you need a candle. You know, what's going to help us get in the mood for prayer? Or maybe some meditation techniques to really get into the zone. Or perhaps Jesus is going to teach them what the best time is to pray, how long we should pray. Maybe give us tips for staying awake in the all-night prayer meeting. Uh, maybe they need to know whether they want their, should have their eyes closed. Is it okay to drink very strong coffee while praying? Is it okay to pray while driving heavy machinery? Whatever they're expecting, verse 2, Jesus says, when you pray, say. Now, you might think that's really obvious, but we need to be really clear on that. It needs to be said that prayer is about saying words to God. Prayer is about saying words to God. Not feelings of peace and calm. You can pray when you're not feeling in the zone. That's okay. Prayer is not listening to God. Listening to God, sitting at Jesus' feet, comes through the word. Prayer is saying words to God. And Jesus says here, when you pray, it could be translated whenever you pray, as in every single time you pray, this is what you should pray. So do we only pray using these words? Well, no, uh, because... Other prayers are recorded for us in the New Testament, aren't they? So while we think these words are very important, they're obviously not the only way we pray. The prayer gives us words to say, but also uh, a structure, uh, the themes to pray, the pattern to follow. So yes, by all means, say these words, and we'll say a version of them at the end, uh, but a pattern to follow too. And when you pray, Jesus says, say, Father. So we are to pray to your Father. Jesus could have chosen, chosen any number of titles, Lord God, God Most High, Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Eternal God, the Living God, just a few titles from the book of Genesis. But instead, Jesus chooses the word Father. Now, God does call himself Father uh, right back in the Exodus when he calls Israel, his people, his firstborn son. But a massive change is happening with Jesus. Now, you and I can call God our Father, and this is really significant I wonder, please, if you'd look back to chapter 10 and verses 21 and 22. So it's back over the page, page 1041. Okay, chapter 10 and verse 21. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Jesus calls God Father. And then in verse 22, Jesus talks to the people. 
All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Can you see what Jesus says there? No one knows who the Father is. No one. No one can have that relationship with God. Only Jesus. There's a barrier between God and his creatures. And that's a barrier that we have built. A decision was made that we're all part of. A decision to reject God, to spiritually leave home and cut off the relationship with him. No one knows the Father because we don't want to know him as Father and God gives us the consequences of that decision. There's a complete breakdown in our relationship with God and there's no way back from our side. We are fatherless. That's what it means to be human. That's what it means, what the Bible says, to be in Adam, to be like our human father. But here's Jesus, and Jesus says, I, the Son, know the Father. And he's our only hope we have of getting home to our Father. And Jesus can introduce people into the family. It's as if Jesus says, Dad, I've rescued, insert your own name. Can he come and be part of our family? And Jesus knows his Father. And he knows the answer will be yes. Through Jesus, we can come into the Father's house and be a child of God. And of course, Jesus goes on in Luke, in the other Gospels, in, in history, to bring people into his family at great cost to himself. And the barrier between us and God is removed by him dying on the cross. And God's good and right anger at the way we've treated God, his world, and one another, Jesus takes it for us. And that's how Jesus can take us home to the Father. So when Jesus calls God Father, he's not just... Um, saying this is how to pray. He's instituting a new relationship. He's saying you can call God Father too. I am here, the Son, so that you can call God Father. He invites his disciples and he says, I've chosen you. I'm taking you to my Father. I'm bringing you into the family. And this morning, you and I can call God Father. And that's an immense privilege that I don't know about you, but I take for granted every day. You can call the creator of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth, what Jesus the Son calls him, Father. How long do you have to wait? To see a doctor. Sometimes it's ages, sometimes it's quite quick, depending on if it's an emergency or not. And if you wanted to meet our MP, David Morris, you'd have to call or email to make an appointment. Or you could try, like I have. Even good friends can be hard to pin down, can't they? Busy, busy people, hard to pin down. But you and I can address the creator of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth, today, this morning, right now. Even as I'm preaching, you can pray. Pray that people are hearing the word this morning. Prayer is about relationship, like a toddler climbing into his dad's lap for a chat. That's what Jesus brings us with God, the Lord of everything. Loving relationship. Those whom Jesus has rescued can call God Father. So if you're not a Christian here this morning, I just need to tell you that God is our Father. He's not a supreme being, cold and distant and far away, or a God who wound up the universe like a giant clock and sits back and lets it unwind over time. The Christian God is our Father. And it really is the greatest joy to know God as Father, to have that barrier of sin and judgment removed forever and to be in his family as a son or a daughter. And our Father loves to speak to us and our Father loves us to speak to him. So if you're not a Christian, can I urge you to take up Jesus' offer? God can be your Father too if you come to Jesus for forgiveness. And for Christians here, too busy to pray, too guilty to pray, too proud to pray, would never say that of course, too fatalistic to pray, too faithless to pray. This is what prayer is. You're a child of the Father in his family because Jesus the Son has brought you home. So yes, you are commanded to pray. But first, enjoy this. You get to pray. You get to pray 
What a privilege to make the most of. And this is what we are to pray for his kingdom. We pray for his kingdom. So first, can you see it there? Back on page 1042, 1042, at the bottom of the first column, Father, hallowed be your name. And my first name means ruler with a spear. And my surname, Straker, but according to my family, it's a Viking name, okay? So um, my middle name, I think, means, uh, which is Richard, means strong ruler. So uh, my name, I, I don't think really reflects my job, my culture, or uh, my lack of bloodthirstiness and pillaging. Ruler with a spear and a Viking longship to represent the Viking name. It's pretty rare for us that our name has much to do with our character or our job. But in the Bible, God's name stands for his whole person. His whole person exactly. So asking for God's name to be hallowed is to ask for God himself to be hallowed. And hallowed is a funny word, isn't it? We don't use that in normal conversation. You might talk about the hallowed turf of the football pitch or something, the sort of the ground that you sort of revere and respect. But other than that, we don't use that word in normal conversation. But hallowed means uh, to be honoured, to be set apart, to be treated as holy and treated with awe. It means to treat God as God. And if you and I call God Father, if we're in relationship with him, then we will want that. We will want God's name to be glorified and honoured and hallowed and respected and given the glory he is due. God is our maker. God is our saviour in Christ Jesus. And God is our ruler. All praise is due his name. He is worthy. And I want to say it's tragic and sinful and actually disgusting when God isn't given what he deserves. For us, and it's sad to say this is often me, for us not to give God all the glory, to not love and delight in him is insulting to God. It's actually the essence of sin to not hallow his name, isn't it? To not give him the glory. And Jesus wants us to pray for God's glory because anything else is idolatry, idolatry. It's an answer on the sheet this morning, kids. Idolatry means worshipping anything other than God. God wants glory for himself because anything else is idolatry. And so we want to pray that God will be honoured. The world does revolve around him and not us. And we acknowledge that as we pray, hallowed be your name. This is a prayer for people to recognise God. Give him what is his, his name, his person, to be hallowed and honoured and glorified. How is God going to do that? Verse 2 again. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. That's how God's name will be honoured and glorified, by his kingdom coming. What's God's kingdom? God's kingdom is his rule through his king Jesus. God's kingdom is his rule through his king Jesus. So we're praying for people to submit to God's rule, to uh, submit to God's King Jesus. In other words, we pray for people to repent. We pray for people to stop trying to live independent lives against God, but instead come to depend on God the, as Father themselves. And we're praying for that great day in the future when everyone, whether they want to or not, will have to say, Jesus is Lord. He is the King. When everyone will bow the knee and confess with their mouths, Jesus is Lord. And that's why much of our prayers and prayer meetings are focused on mission. Mission is another word for saying God's kingdom coming. We want people to submit to God's rule, God's King Jesus, because it brings glory to God. And it's the best thing for them, isn't it? Does that make sense? Praying for God's kingdom is the same as praying for mission, for people to submit to Jesus as king. And this is war. This is what Sam Albury says. The Lord's Prayer, properly understood, is meant to be offensive, as in an attack. It's like the national anthem being played in an enemy country. It's declaring as we pray it. God is kingdom's coming. Jesus is the king. And we're declaring it in an enemy country because we're still living in this world, aren't we? This is war. This is God's holy war. This is what we're praying for. 
So, you know, uh, people say they have Lord's Prayer up and down the country, don't they, without believing the words. But uh, if they thought about what the words are saying, it's a declaration of war on the devil and the world and the flesh. And so we want to be praying for people who don't know Jesus. The preaching of the word, after all, that's what God uses to change independent hearts to dependent hearts. We'll be praying for our evangelism, our speaking about Jesus. It's great to hear Hannah's prayers about the barbecue on, on Sunday. We're praying, aren't we, people to come, meet us, so that we can speak Jesus to them. Our church courses and events, and we're training for this work. The preacher bringing God's word. Our church family as well, to submit to that word together. Because, of course, Jesus' reign is over Christians, and we need to keep submitting to Jesus' reign, to Jesus as king in our lives. So we're really praying for mission and godliness, for the kingdom to come over us and other people too. Thanks, Matt. I'll take that one down. Thank you. And I wanted to say, if we're honest, is that the content of our prayers? And I know it's so easy for our prayers to drift into... Uh, are there good prayers? You know, prayers for health and so on. They're, they're good to ask our Heavenly Father about. But I wonder if this is the first thing that we're praying for, God's kingdom to come, for people to submit to the rule of Christ now and in the future. So easy to slip into praying for our concerns and the concerns of others. Instead of these greatest concerns of all, which actually is the thing that everybody needs most of all, to have Jesus as King. So when we pray... For God's name to be honoured and his kingdom to come. It's bringing glory to God, but it's what's best for his church. And it's what's best for the world as well. So easy to forget that. I know that myself. So here we are, praying. And you know what? To comfort you, we are praying for what God is going to do. God's name will be hallowed. God's kingdom will come because he's in charge of all this. He will do this. So why pray this then? Why pray then? Two reasons why we pray even though God's going to do it anyway. First, prayer changes us. Prayer changes us. When we pray, we hand things over to God. We depend on him. We focus again on him, his concerns. As we do that, we take on the family likeness more and more. We trust him all over again to do what he has promised. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God, it changes me. Prayer changes us. The situation we're in may not change, as it will sometimes, it may not always change, but as we give it to God, we're trusting in his fatherly goodness towards us. We're trusting in his power to sort things out. We're trusting in his wisdom to do things best. And so as we turn to our Father, prayer changes us. Doug Wilson says, my prayers will either move God to act or will move me to rest. As we trust in him, prayer changes us. That's the first thing. Second, prayer really does change things too. Because God has promised to hear our prayers and answer them. Prayer changes us. And prayer changes things. How come? Because God invites us into relationship. I think there's a slide for that, Matt, is there? God uh, invites us into relationship. Because of that, he asks us to ask for what he will do. Just spend a moment getting that around your, he uh, your head around that. God asks us to ask for what he will do. <coughs> Suppose I take uh, my children on the prom this afternoon, which I'm hoping to do. Suppose just imagine I do that. And, um, you know, it's a hot day, isn't it, today? And, uh, it, we, you know, we see the ice cream shop or whatever. And I've got money in my pocket because I've actually planned ahead for once, which would be good, not a card. They take you they take whatever. I've got the right money. I know what, they, what we're going to do. I've planned it. But I also know what they're going to ask me as we see the ice cream shop or whatever. I know I'm going to say yes. But I want them to speak to me I want to enjoy the moment when they ask and enjoy the moment when I say yes. So I know what's going to happen. They're going to get an ice cream on that particular day. Although now they're looking like it's, this is an imaginary scenario. Oh no, we should, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. <laughs> I know what we're going to do. I've planned it. I know other people want to come too, as long as we're distanced and all the rest of it for one more day. Yeah. Uh, we've planned it. 
I've thought about it. I've got the money in my pocket. It's going to happen anyway. And I want them to ask me because guess what? I've got a relationship because they're my children. And it's a little glimpse. It's not a perfect illustration, of course, but it's a little glimpse of what it's like with us and our Heavenly Father. He's planned to do wonderful things. And he wants you and I to ask him to do wonderful things because prayer is about what? Relationship. You're a child of your Heavenly Father. I just think that's extraordinary. I've been, I, it was helpful to me to do this this week again because I forget this stuff, even though it's so critical. Yes, you're commanded to pray, but more than that, you get to pray. You get to pray, which is just wonderful. Praying to our Father in Heaven is a bit like this. A bit like me and my children, planning something lovely for them, but hoping and wanting them to ask me so that I can give them what they ask for. We get to be involved in this work. God doesn't need you and me, but he wants you and me. Isn't that lovely? His children to be part of what he's doing. Like a human father who loves his children, helping him with DIY or the gardening. I do love it when my kids offer help. It's such a lovely thing. It's not always quicker, but I love it. As children of God, we get to ask our Heavenly Father, what a privilege. We get to be powerfully involved in his work to save the world. He loves us and plans to use our help. And, and this means you and I get to change the world. Isn't that an extraordinary thought? God wants you and I to change the world. And so we pray for his kingdom. And we pray, more briefly, uh, I think, for his kingdom over us. His kingdom over us. Give us each day our daily bread. I don't know, uh, you know the Lord's Prayer, I think, so you know that's what comes next. But it's actually quite surprising. The next prayer is for bread. For food. Provisions. Give us each day our daily bread. There we were, praying for God's kingdom to come. The spread of the gospel, the glorious future with Jesus the King returning. We're looking forward to it. Suddenly Jesus says, pray for a loaf of bread. So we know what's coming, but it's still quite surprising to go from massive kingdom concerns to what you'd want for your food today. Now, bread stands for food. If someone invites you to a barbecue, as we're doing this next week, is there a slide for that, Matt? There we go. I think you'd expect... It's just one item, some barbecue tongs. If you go to a barbecue you'd be surprised if all you got was a plate of meat. I mean, you might, some of you might not mind that, but just meat. No buns, no ketchup, no salad, no onions, no drink, and then no pudding. The barbecue meat is the main thing, and it stands for the whole meal. If you go to a barbecue, you're expecting barbecued meat, yes, but also you'd think bread, ketchup, drinks, whatever, wouldn't you? A bit like that for bread. So bread stands for things that you need. It's like a staple food, and it stands for the whole meal. So praying for bread stands for praying for food, and it probably stands for all that you need every day. All that you need every day. A bit like the manna uh, that the Israelites had in the wilderness. So can you see, actually, if we're praying for everything we need, can you see how this prayer does flow from the first, pr from the first, first prayer? First, first prayer, prayer, Lord, Lord please, please your name, name be glorified. Okay? Would your name, name be hallowed. hallowed. And, and as we, we depend, depend on him and look to him and give him the glory and recognise him as king, we recognise him as the giver of our daily bread, of everything. Yeah? Can you see that? So give us our day our daily bread reflects the first prayer, which is that God should be glorified and honoured as God. Okay, God, God is God. He gives you my food. Lord, please would you give me my food. Can you see that? Please would you look after me today. Please would you care for me today and give me all that I need. This, this is God's, God's children, giving credit, credit where credit, credit is due. Pray, pray for our food. Also pray, pray for our forgiveness. Or our pardon, an old-fashioned word for forgiveness. Verse 4. Forgive us our sins, but we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And this is a prayer, I think this helps, this is a prayer for Jesus' disciples. This is not the prayer of a, a new believer first. It's not that our forgiveness depends on us doing something to others. This prayer for forgiveness is the regular prayer of the Christian, like the confession of sin that we usually do at the beginning of our gathering on a Sunday. And Jesus says, Christians, keep on praying for forgiveness. We're like children who disobey our parents, 
Uh, and, and we're, we're still, still children, children, aren't we? we? But, but we, we need, need to, to say, say sorry if we've been disobedient, which is what we do in our family. I'm sure if you've had kids in the past or you were a child or you have kids now, you, you, you children say sorry, don't you, you kids? We've done something wrong. wrong. You're just a child, child in your family. family. And, so and so as we, we ask, ask for forgiveness again, so we forgive, forgive our brothers and sisters. sisters. I've, I've got, got a, a, a kid, I, I want to talk to kids for a minute, but the adults, adults listen in. in. Kids, if you upset your brother or sister, did you know that you upset your parents too? It took, it took quite a long, long time, time to clock that. I think I was an adult before I really realised it. But when me and my brother were quite, quite close in age, we perhaps fight or uh, physically or verbally, and obviously it's sad between me and my brother, but actually it would upset my mum as well in particular, and also my dad, I guess. When the relationship between the siblings isn't right, the parents aren't unhappy either because the parents love both the siblings that are fighting or arguing. They're not happy that, that, that people have upset each other. And then when you say sorry for calling each other names or whatever you've done or being selfish, then relationships are still between the brother and sister and brothers, but all the sisters, but also between the parents as well and the child children. Does that make sense? That children, when you upset one another, you upset your parents as well. And when we upset one another and hurt one another, we upset our Heavenly Father, if we put it like that. We grieve the Holy Spirit. So when there's something unresolved with a Christian brother or sister, whom God loves very dearly indeed at the cost of Jesus' blood, if there's something unresolved between us, then there's something unresolved with God. God's not happy about that. So we can't really expect forgiveness ourselves if we haven't forgiven. We show we haven't understood perhaps the depth of our own sin or have forgotten the depth of our own sin and God's forgiveness of all of my sins if I don't forgive my brothers and sisters and their comparatively tiny sins against us. As we approach God and ask for forgiveness for all that we've done wrong against him, we can hardly not forgive others. So when we pray... We look again at our relationship with our father and his other children too. And we pray about those relationships with our father and our brothers and sisters. And we're praying, therefore, for family life and for unity among God's people. This prayer is all about relationships in the kingdom with the father and our brothers and sisters. God's kingdom over us. And the final prayer Jesus wants us to pray for is protection, for defence. Now you can see why I chose P for pardon, yeah? Because I wanted to have the third P, but I apologise uh, for that. Protection, defence. Lead us not into temptation. That seems a bit strange, because why would God be leading us into temptation in the first place? God doesn't tempt people. I think this is a, a way of saying that Jesus uses to express very strongly the exact opposite. So lead us as far as possible away from temptation. The double negative of not and temptation is a way of saying the positive really, really strongly. Please, Lord, lead us into good paths. Keep us safe from the tempter. Only God can do that. On our own, you'll know this, we give in all too easily. We need our Father's help. We need God's kingdom over us. God, our King and Father, protecting us. Jesus, looking after us. And so we ask for God's help so that we can fight sin. And as we do that, his rule is extended over us. His kingdom is coming over his people more and more. So we pray to extend the kingdom, to depend on God, our loving, powerful Father and King. He's the one who brings us into his family through Jesus. That's how we can know the Father. And he keeps us in the family too. We need God to do everything. You and I have this privilege of prayer. We can pray for God's kingdom, his mission, and for godliness in the church, God's kingdom over us, his, our provision, our, our gifts that he gives us, our forgiveness that we can keep we can come back for, and our protection from the devil. We can pray. We can pray these amazing things that change the world, that change the church, that change your hearts, because it's God has planned to use your prayers in his great plan. So when you sit down and pray, he's planned to use that prayer. Isn't that a lovely comforting thought? We can pray. We get this privilege. And if we get this, 
forget what what prayer prayer is. There's There's no no way way we'll be too busy busy to pray because we'll want to pray. God is our Father. We're invited into a relationship with him. Wow! There's no way we'll be too guilty to pray. We want to bring our guilt to God. Yes, we've mucked up, you might have mucked up badly. You might have been walking away from the Lord. But you can come to him for forgiveness. Just like that. You can come back to him. And there's no way we'll be too proud. There's no way we're going to, if we're humble and depending on our Heavenly Father, we'll know that we need, we need, we are needy. You are needy. You need him. And even the people that don't think they do, they do. They're taking his gifts all the time without thanking him. You don't want to be too fatalistic either because prayer really does change things. The Lord has planned to use your prayers to change things. Don't be too faithless. God has planned to use your prayers to change things, to change us and to change the world. We get to change the world. And we're going to do that right now as we pray. We're going to pray using a longer version of the Lord's Prayer, mostly from Matthew's Gospel. We can pray. You get to pray. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. That is wonderful stuff.